We live in a fast-paced and hectic world where it's easy to feel overwhelmed, stressed, and out of control. How do you manage all the competing pressures without losing sense of yourself? How do you stay focused enough to not only plot a path, but follow it? Welcome to Master Your Life, a show that offers inspiration, insight, and intelligence, as well as success stories from many walks of life that can show you how you can control your own destiny. Our knowledgeable and entertaining host and her guests give practical advice that you can use every day in the quest to master your life. Now, here's your host, Leah Mattinson. Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's episode. I'm host Leah Mattinson. And first of all, thank you to each and every one of you for joining us from wherever it is that you are in this beautiful world of ours today as you're listening or watching this podcast um, on masteryourlife.ca. You can pick up the video version, so be sure to join us over there. Um, you'll see that I am now uh, recording from my bedroom. So if you're interested in what... <laughs> <laughs> We've got grandkids that are have, are coming to visit, and so I, I've been uh, relegated to the to the bedroom <laughs> for doing my interviews. Oh man, so much fun! Um, you know, we're t- we're laughing and starting out this episode with Dr. David Hardy. Dr. Dave, how are you doing this morning? Oh, fantastic! Thanks for having me again. I appreciate it. Awesome. His office looks way classier, so <laughs> you can check that out. That's right, and. Uh, and make sure again to come and check out Dave's work at thehardybrain.ca. Um, this episode, we're going to be talking about something that's near and dear to Dr. David Hardy's heart, and that is the homeless situation, um, not de- just in uh, the town or city where he lives, but also worldwide and and sort of what's coming um, up for people who are homeless, what's created this situation of homelessness and poverty. Um, that we are seeing worldwide, and are the things that we can do um, to help people? What are what are sort of the primary things that you're seeing, Doctor Hardy, that um, are of concern to you? That concern enough that you would have got involved in this area in the first place? Yeah, absolutely. Um, no, it's just kind of uh, one of those those areas uh, I think are underserved in society, mm-hmm. and especially underserved in healthcare. Um, I think it's just managed versus actually looking at underlying causes to, to help people that are in rough situations. And there's obviously a reason why people uh, can't afford or don't have the skills to, to kind of live productively in society. And of course, there's a huge mental health. And with mental health, there's always a brain health component to it. There's something physical with it. And that's kind of being being ignored. And uh, then, of course, there's addiction issues as well, and quite commonly. And uh, once again, with addictions too, there's physical drivers causing people to want to crave and and go get this substance um, beyond belief, and really at the the detriment to, to their own lives and and well being and safety and and uh, then, of course, uh, financially as well. And uh, it's just kind of been one of those issues that, that I've really been drawn to because it's, it's underserved and there are a lot of aspects that, that could be improved, in my opinion, in, in the health field on this. Mm-hmm. And so how long have you been involved in working with those populations? I started um, working um, with patients in the post-addiction uh, field, uh, referrals from uh, psychologists or counselors. Uh, basically, when I started uh, my chiropractic career and my functional neurology was, uh, we were looking at the, the physical drivers and trying to see if we could change how the brain nervous system was functioning to hopefully decrease any cravings and impulsivity um, based off of what we were finding within the the individual neurology of these these people. And uh, we weren't in the counseling realm or the actual addiction fields. We were once again looking at the physical aspects that could possibly cause underlying issues 
And the feedback we were getting from the counselors that of the, the people we were working with was that they were able to reach a usually a higher level in their therapies because they were functioning better and able to process things mm -hmm. a lot better as well. And uh, I, I'm just like, why, why wouldn't we want to try more and more of this? And yeah, in, in kind of that counseling and psychology realm, there are a few stimulation techniques um, such as different eye movements or uh, somatic experiences that, that really help as well. Uh, but when we do the neurologic examinations and really pinpoint what areas of the brain and nervous system are dysfunctional mm -hmm. and then really match our therapies and modalities to those areas of the brain, uh, the results are, <laughs> are exponential in comparison. Right. Uh, so can you share a story of something, someone that's had a successful treatment and what their life looked like before and then how it changed. Yeah, right when I, when I was starting there, there was one uh, a 20 year old coming through and uh, he, uh, he always seemed very ramped up and angry to some extent, like he was gonna, gonna lose it. Mm -hmm. And of course, this is a person that's taking in substances to basically calm himself down. So, we were looking at different ways to calm the nervous system down. And uh, there's one day he's coming through and he's kind of in this ramped up state. And uh, another, another patient asks him, well, what, what have you noticed about it? And he's like, I'm able to think better. <laughs> and though, even though he was in that ramped up, uh, really kind of, you, you think he's about ready to kind of snap, uh, He's still thinking better and clearer and is got that belief uh, from experiencing things that he is able to function better. And uh, then just looking years after the fact, uh, uh, his career progression hasn't been that relapse. And he's able to to move forward in his life and, and really function in, in, uh, in the job world as well. And is, is doing really well. Another one was, uh, another college student came through and, uh, he was having auditory hallucinations. So He's having auditory hallucinations. Yeah. He was basically stopping looking around the room, uh, We lost you there for a second. Yeah, so he would be hearing voices and having to look around wherever he was, whatever classroom or situation he was in, and see if somebody was actually talking to him. And this was happening about a dozen times per day. And... Uh, we, we found some things kind of on the neurologic examination and then we ran neurofeedback QEEGs, so quantitative EEGs. And uh, we noticed that one of his temporal lobes was just lit up like a Christmas tree. So it was way overactive. And we started to train that one site down uh, using neurofeedback. And within a week, he started to notice that he was having less and less of these episodes. And uh, then of course, uh, he wasn't feeling as anxious and he wasn't reaching for the, for the alcohol and booze as much. So right there, if you kind of look at these underlying issues and what's causing it and address those, then quite commonly you're able to, to get into why they're, they're using in the first place. Right. So, so, so it's very fascinating and uh, interesting to me. I worked with a group of, of kids that were, um, and I call them kids, they were 17 to 25 year olds who had uh, psychosis. And yeah. I was it, the group was supposed to be getting back to work. And so this was um, usually drug-induced psychosis. So some of them had auditory. Yeah. 
yeah. and they were all in that age group though and why i say it was fascinating and heartbreaking also because they mm -hmm. all had dual diagnoses they all had oh, absolutely stamps of what they had had in the past some of them had been treated for years with medication and you know they can come into the programs and you you know you know that they're going to have their funding cut yep like when, when you're optimistic you think no they're not going to you know this is a great program and this is really helping people but it gets cut and then people get really discouraged and it's hard so i do want people to think about that um, because you're asking as a society of people who are well, you look at people who are quote unquote, not well, and you go, well, they should be doing better. What's wrong with them? Why, why can't right. they, why and can't they comes, figure that out? Especially if they look decent, yeah. especially if they look reasonably <laughs> physically okay. Cause you can't mm -hmm. actually see this stuff. So it's very, um, hard for young people and old people who are yep. having these neurological problems when they go in to try and get help from anybody that yeah. just they are it, it often falls on deaf ears and then we wonder why people end up homeless well because they can't get help and mm -hmm. it's often generational too like it's not just that one generation is dealing with these issues it's multiple generations so the support people who are supposed to be helping you aren't equipped to help yes yeah and let's look at an easy example such as mm -hmm. pain well, you've got the sensation of pain. So of course you're going to reach for something that knocks that pain out. And, uh, well, there's all sorts of addictive substances that will do that. And the opioid ec epidemic is, is documented and well known in that, that, that arena. Mm -hmm. Um, but they were ignoring all other ways to knock down pain and reaching for the, for the sledgehammer and over prescribing that and leading to this this crisis that that occurred mm -hmm. um but we we know that there are different modalities and therapies out there that are non-drug <laughs> therapies and for pain disorders uh, we're starting to see a decline obviously in part because some of those are now being recognized and used <laughs> in instead of the other uh, so, so there is some, some hope with that, but, uh, the second we mention any other kind of addiction, it all goes, goes to willpower and, and of course, have they had any, any trauma or abuse issues as well. Mm -hmm. And there, there are a lot of psychologists out there that are recognizing that there are physical manifestations of, of all these issues as well that you can't be overstressed without something physical occurring and that then leads to okay let's have these combination approaches and we know with the nervous system and the brain that uh, different pathways are going to use the same chemicals so treating it chemically is not always a good idea and actually the efficacy on it is is fairly low in research standards and i was talking to one phd uh, from uh, university of calgary and she flat out stated that uh, you would think in mental health in a country like canada that you're getting the most updated and research-based evidence uh, approaches and she's like uh, no there's all sorts of other research out there on uh, uh, her area is more on the micronutrients and that aspect and uh, and there is a lot of good solid research on that and that the other research that's being used to uh, to dictate uh, what treatments are used are biased. They're not independently researched. They're straight from the manufacturers of the pharmaceuticals that are, are being prescribed. Mm -hmm. And uh, that is extremely biased and has uh, really dictated that area of the health field. Uh, much... Uh, to the same way that maybe opiates was was um, kind of the the treatment of choice 
uh, prior to to the crisis that happened. And uh, there are similarities in that area, to to be honest. And there are there differences between somebody having an opioid or drug addiction versus a craving alcohol. Oh, absolutely. There, there's difference with each substances. And to to simplify it, people are looking to change their state. That's mm-hmm. that's why you go out and and have a whole bunch of <laughs> cans of beers or balls of wine after work when you're stressed out. Is that's calming the system down and giving you another feeling. And uh, well, let's look at actually what's kind of ramping the system up and why you would want to want to want to use this in the first place. And then, of course, if you're more lethargic, you're going to be looking for something that brings you up and stimulates you. And mm-hmm. and there's all sorts of substances that will do that. So. Um, it's all trying to figure out what state somebody wants to be in and then mm-hmm. matching that up and seeing, okay, well, is there something underlying that is causing that? Mm-hmm. And some people can go out, have one or two drinks and be completely fine with that and cut themselves off and others are going to start pounding them and pounding them. So um, there, there's also physiological issues behind that. And of course, genetics plays into it as well. And uh, on the genetic side, though, I'm not one that likes to blame your genetics and, and use that as an excuse. I really like the aspects of the functional genomics where you're looking at your genomics and, okay, well, if there is a problem with converting dopamine, um, how can we support those dopamine pathways so that somebody's less likely to have that hit of a substance and go, well, this is the best thing ever and I'm not going to stop using it. And uh, that's kind of the, the key aspects is looking at how the nervous system's firing and then also looking at the underlying uh, uh, metabolic and other processes that might lead somebody to really wanting that substance in the first place. And, uh, and of course, addressing the issues of, of trauma, abuse, and everything else that would also lead somebody to want to mask that and, uh, and go into a different state. And uh, it's a complex picture, and uh, it, it does take a lot of resources, um, but it's one of those things. Are we actually trying to, to help people kind of heal through this, or are we, uh, we just throwing a cheaper solution at the problem and hoping it works. And well, we've seen that doesn't work. So Mm -hmm. what I, I think it's complex, but it's also simple (laughs) in that (laughs) there's simplicity in things and often we get ourselves tied up into Mm -hmm. knots about um, these big social issues. So then everybody, (laughs) um, the expectation is now, Oh, well, everyone run and, you know, do whatever it is that virtue signal that you're taking care of homeless people. Like that's actually the opposite of helpful. Oh, exactly. So personal yeah. responsibility mm-hmm. when you've got a neurological problem is still your personal responsibility. <laughs> so you've got to figure that out. I, and I have, I mean, I've worked with many, many clients who've got neurological problems and complex issues, very complex family um, health yeah, yeah. issues. And one of the things I think we're afraid to do is call other people on their behavior that mm-hmm. is offside, right? So it's just like you're acting, something is not right with you, the way that you're behaving. Mm-hmm. And and often when people have neurological problems, they can't self-identify. They're not self-reflective. They don't have that capacity. So it's not that they're necessarily innately evil and trying to be horrible. It's just that they are. And they really don't, if you're not saying to them, hey, like that's what you're doing there is not correct. And, and this whole, I don't yeah. want to say anything because I don't want to be, I don't want to be stepping on anyone's self-identified awesomeness. It's like, no, actually you need to, or the culture is in an absolute mess and right. that's people's lives are in an absolute mess. So this is the perspective of someone who's, you know, 54 and been working in the field, quote unquote, mental health for many, many decades, Right, both Absolutely. paid and unpaid. And, you know, so not for profit and for profit. And going, no, it's like you have to have personal responsibility in this. Number one, to say to people when they're doing things that are 
aberrant, which means yeah. not proper behavior, to say that's not proper. I just had this really great example. So, and I'm going to share it. So some somebody's <laughs> teenage boy, um, bless his heart, 14 years old, or fifth, just turned 15 years old. And in Alberta, Canada, you can have your learner's permit when you're 14, which means that you actually go take a test and you can... Uh, write it. And then when you pass that, you can actually drive with somebody in the vehicle that actually has a driver's license. But this young fella decided that he was just going to not bother taking his uh, test for, you know, passing his learner's permit, and then just to go on a joy ride while his parent was out of town. <laughs> so, uh, right. So lots of consequences, though, that are not funny. And so, you know, he, the guy, the People can lose their businesses. They could kill somebody. Like there's all kinds of stuff that are that's serious. Mm -hmm. And so uh, lots of the friends weighed in and just said like, well, we weren't raised like that. Of course, we wouldn't think about taking our parents' vehicle. Like we just wouldn't even think about it. Like you would have asked permission or there would have been consequences. And, you, you know, like it wouldn't even have crossed your mind. And then the, some other people weighing in saying, Oh, well, you know, I went for a joyride when I was that age and ha, 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 nothing happened, blah, blah. But this wow. is where kind of the rubber meets the road, where you actually can't laugh off the behavior that is like offside. And I'm again, it's like I've not been completely law abiding my entire life, certainly not in the last three years. <laughs> <laughs> Still don't own a mask. So, you know, there's, there, so I wouldn't say that I'm somebody that is like a complete stickler for things, but when we go um, where you're causing potentially harm to other people, there has to be sort of an agreed upon boundaries where, where it's not okay to just behave um, completely aberrantly. And that oh, includes, absolutely. you know, drunk, being drunk when you're little, allowing drugs and alcohol into your little people's hands, and then putting the blame on the, the quote unquote system. It's like, no, you're, you're the adults. You're supposed to be taking care of those little ones. And yeah, absolutely. Yep. And your friends aren't supposed to be talking you into that. It's okay to act that way. Nah, it's okay. It's all right. If they do that, it's not for their neurology. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and, and a lot of us too, like we, we've all kind of gone through that party phase in our life and some it's been longer than, than just a little phase, obviously. And all sorts of stupid things happen from that as well. Um, so yeah, it does come down to a lot of those decisions. And uh, a lot of people are looking for that escape though as well. And there's some reason that they're drawn to that party lifestyle and everything else. And uh, it, it is one of those things that, well, how do we not become the fun police, but at the same time help people that, that are struggling in this multi modality and, and way and it is a combination of all of the above that there is still decisions that people can make and uh right. and they're going to be foggy or are clear and uh uh yeah i'd be be a hypocrite to say that that uh mm -hmm. the, the party phase and everything else uh didn't happen in my life as well and uh and that there were poor decisions made with that um, sure. And the brainwashing that goes along with that too. So part of it is like letting yourself, ourselves off the collective hook, because there's been very intentional brainwashing oh, around yeah. all this terrible behavior. You know, when you've got your newscasters on in the morning, mixing cocktails, <laughs> because that's how they're, it's like, that's what people that's are doing. That's how they're coping. Yeah. That's how they're coping. So it's okay to do right. that. But you're, so we're all very heavily influenced by that. But if you sat back and thought about what you're trying to create in your life, which is what people are doing when they're listening to this podcast. Absolutely. This one, master your life. So it's not like whatever, the million other things that people listen to. You're here listening because you're trying to figure out how did my life get to have these pain points that I don't like and that I want to actually improve upon. So to kind of whitewash it and say, no, it's like you have to go, there is something wrong here that I don't have control over and that I could end up homeless. You know, the town I live in, there's not one single service for homeless people here. And I'm like, what do they do for homeless people? Where are they? I live in a city. It's like 30,000 people. Where, where's the homeless people? Everyone mm -hmm. looks around blankly. I don't know where they are. Maybe they're in Red Deer, Dave. Maybe. Maybe they yeah. got shipped to Red Deer. Like they're shipped somewhere. Because mm -hmm. not everybody here can afford a house. So where right. are they? Yeah. 
And it's not just all the addiction realm as well. There's, there's right. a lot of people that are facing financial hardships um, yes. with everything that's happening as well that, that are on the cusp of this. And yes. of course, we, we all think that they're, these issues are so intertwined. And in a lot of cases, it's not. It's, it's something else going on. Uh, so I, I don't want to lead people down that, that road that, no, we think uh, all homeless people are have an addiction problem or, or something going on there. And yes. uh, it might be something else. And those supports um, are coming in. Um, there is, of course, uh, uh, a lack of affordable housing for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And there is a huge segment of the population where they're spending over half of their their income on housing mm -hmm. that leaves very little to nothing left over. Mm -hmm. And uh, then you have to think of the, the houses they're living in. It, it's probably not a great situation anyways. And a lot of these places are, they're probably not good for their health either, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's, it's a complex issue that, uh, that needs needs a lot of attention and it, it's a problem that's obviously getting worse and worse and with the economic and and uh, social uh, concerns that are happening or that that may increase we don't know um, is this problem going to get worse before it gets better and uh, there there is no answer to that but my prediction is it's probably going to get worse and and that's that's going to take a lot of, a lot of uh, leadership to, to help people out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so what are some of the best solutions that you've seen for helping people to get, let's say just the homeless issue? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, there, there's, um, well, right now, the biggest need is permanent supportive housing. So these are for people that, that um, have multiple issues going on with them. Mm -hmm. And that seems to be the 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 bottleneck um, in a lot of lot of these, and I think that's where the crossover with healthcare comes in as well. Is uh, the the amazing people in the mental health field are, are doing extremely good work with with the tools they they have, um, and my only kind of uh, uh, comment on that is that uh, yeah we need to be looking at other areas of the health field to, to help these people out and, and get them healthier. And uh, that's um, kind of not, not in the, the conversations as much as I think it should be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so what would, what difference would it make if people were healthier? Right. In and circumstances? You're looking at better decisions and being able to function better. And if people are able to function better, then they're able to hold employment then that should uh, be, be more profitable for them or uh, make less of the negative spending if that's an issue as well. But usually it's not with such low income. And uh, that, that does really fit into, into how people also handle stress and physically are able to go about their day and actually have a productive day and uh, struggle less and suffer less. And that would be the goal is to get people functioning and feeling better so that uh, there's less problems. And we've all been in those situations where we're stressed out and are we start to get, get uh, more irritable. Well, pretty much every job position out there, you've got to interact with someone. And if physically you don't feel good, you don't interact well with others. Mm -hmm. And uh, <laughs> then how can you, you hold down good employment and, uh, or even work longer hours? And the answer to that, we all know. <laughs> and, uh, so it really does become uh, a huge part of this puzzle to, and that uh, I think is underserved at this point in time. Yeah, and the, I think what's also part of the complexity of things is when people are served by systems, that happens between 8.15 and 4 o'clock 
if you're lucky. Right. So that's not when the problems happen. <laughs> Surprise. <Right. laughs> that's, you know, it's, and it's not, it's, you know, people during the daytime typically often have some sort of routine that's pretty mm -hmm. reasonably decent, you know, and um, yeah. can stay sort of functional. It's those sort of after certain times of day when the social supports aren't in place or the observer effect isn't in place or the people who are observing you are in the same boat as you. So, you know, you get it. And this, this does come down to that, that social piece. Um, and we're seeing that supports in the mental health field are 24 seven and, mm -hmm. and that there are a lot of really great people doing those support roles. Right. And, so are those, uh, I gotta, I need to ask, is that support roles? Cause I, and again, no judgment about it, but is it support right. roles that are over the phone or is it support roles that are boots on the ground? There's mm -hmm. gonna be a combination, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, for some people that needs to be boots on the ground. Mm -hmm. And there's always going to be a certain population that's that's going to always need care. And, right, uh, yes. And the, the whole thing of the, treating these physical issues and putting more resources in kind of in that health area, of course, is going to help a certain segment. And then there's also still going to be a segment that struggles. And that's kind of just the reality of things. And, um, but uh, would we be able to make a bigger dent if we concentrated uh, in different health arenas? And I believe the answer is, of course we can. And, uh, and, uh, there's there's obviously the the, the need for that integration and uh, multi pronged multi discipline approach to it, and we can't just throw a pill at it and think it's going to go away. Mm -hmm. And so, where does the family fit into this? Family support, family. Uh, <laughs> are think... they the first responders or are they the last responders? Oh, family is always going to be the first and maybe even the drivers <laughs> to some of these problems mm -hmm. <laughs> and a combination of both. Mm -hmm. And uh, there is a huge part of the, the population, too, in this this arena that um, are called the um, concealed homeless because they're couch surfing or they're staying with friends and family. Mm -hmm. uh, so they don't show up in the system as much. <laughs> and uh yeah, they're going place to place and uh, they're struggling. They're, they're trying to, to find and make, make a better way if, if that's the case or, or uh, <laughs> just going day to day trying to survive. And uh, that's, that's an issue as well, of course. And, uh, and it doesn't necessarily show up in some of the numbers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and has there been an increase in that um, since the last 10 years where, or maybe eight years where the economies around the world have been sort of, I would imagine it's gone up a lot. And, uh, two, you're going to see this in, uh, in probably a lot of different demographics of, of the population that's maybe higher functioning that yeah, job issues happen and you're, <laughs> you're now out, out of a job and staying with, with your family for a while until you, until you get your feet back on the ground and, uh, and there's, there's huge implications that way. And, uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, that leads to more and more kind of mental health issues or, um, in the short term as well. Mm -hmm. And I think families have been discouraged in our culture from helping other family members in, in some ways, you know, like pick yourself up by your bootstraps, just you'll figure it out. But months and months and months, people are not figuring it out. And then that ends up with them. Um, I think they get tired and fatigued of it as well. Sure. And, uh, absolutely. It's okay. Why is the black sheep of the family on the couch again? <laughs> Type thing. Right. Yes. <laughs> I, yes. Yeah. Just to, to kind of be blunt with that point. But mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, family members or, and friends are, are going to going to get tired of the same person that's kind of got themselves in the same situations. Right. So there's those people. And then I also think that there's people who've lost employment legitimately over the past oh, six, yeah. seven years, whatever, Definitely. like people who would have never thought they would have credit problems, just mm -hmm. don't like their credits blown. You know, they've 
took out too big a house loan. They took, you know, had the boats and the cars and the this and the that and got overextended. People who own multimillionaires who own businesses here oh, who absolutely. went under. So it's not just people who've been the black sheep, it's but it's people who've been quite successful. And that's sometimes even harder for them because they're oh, like, I'm not telling anybody what's going on, man. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I'd rather burn on my own pyre. So, <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. Right. And, and so there is that. Um, yeah, yeah, there is. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I, I've been through that situation myself where I uh, went from treating professional athletes to, oh, here's a whole bunch of student loan debt and you're in between positions and you, you need to come up with money for licensing and everything else and where are you getting that from and mm -hmm. uh, it it's it's a hard hard area and you feel your physical health deteriorate with that mm -hmm. and it, it's anything mentally that's going to put such a stress and burden on you is also going to physically affect you and uh, and uh that can lead to chronic health conditions. Um, I did an interview with uh, one individual. He he uh, he was in the m like hundreds of millions or billions of dollars with companies, mm -hmm. and uh, then he figured he gave himself this rare autoimmune condition because of all the stress he was under. And uh, so the the autoimmune condition was Stephen Johnson syndrome which basically the immune system starts attacking all your skin and glands and this skin starts to blister and kind of melt away from you and not many survive from it. <laughs> so yeah, this is a very successful individual who under a whole lot of stress and his system starts to fail. Um, so there, there is a whole... Uh, a lot of burden to, to the healthcare system because people have have the stress from these situations as well and uh, we we need to need to look at all of it of course across multiple areas and uh, and uh, really kind of in these periods of disruption and uh, chaos that, that happens in society we um the, the be kind and all this messaging is really, really important. Um, but we also need to look at how to physically support people and um, so that their health doesn't deteriorate into, into mm -hmm. a position where it's, where it's in, in the hospital or uh, our, our lines into, into the doctor's offices to get better. Um, so yeah <laughs> some people, and some people don't want to play along as also that like they just don't have uh, an interest or when they ha are in pain they don't right. have an interest in getting well at all so or or they'll just kind of skate on the edge of things until they're really in dire straits so that's a well, that's a yeah, pride it, thing too right a bit it's also, <laughs> yeah kind of meeting people where they're at and realizing that some people are going to hit rock bottom before they bounce back up and others, maybe an intervention or something before that is going to save them from hitting rock bottom. Right. And I just said something that I think is like an underlying subconscious thought, which is mm -hmm. it's like the pride before the fall. But is that true? You know, so when you look at people who are struggling, is it really that they're proud that they don't want to, that they're too proud to share? Or is it they actually have a neurological thing going on that they're not self-identifying? Right. And, and that's a very, very big distinction. And it's going to be both. We all have neurologic issues. And uh, when we all have neurological issues. Oh, no. Right. And when, <laughs> what? when we say this, it's exactly that response. It's like, yes. Oh, my God. Don't say that. Like, there's there's nothing wrong with my brain. That's and, right. Uh, well, let's take everything kind of on this spectrum from pathology to yes. peak performance. And yeah, there are weaknesses in all of our brains and nervous systems and ways we can make ourselves healthier so that we function and feel better. Mm -hmm. And that's that's the point to hammer home. It's not that, oh, you've got this diagnosis or you, <laughs> there's something horribly wrong with, with your brain. Um, no, that, and that's, that's not the, 
the point we're trying to make. The point is obviously there are weaknesses in how we feel and that drives us to, to different situations and uh, that are probably going to be harmful and, and not serve us. So it's a key to figure out ways to make ourselves feel better, perform better and live a happier, better life <laughs> and be able to handle mm -hmm. these situations better so that, that we don't fall, fall down as hard. Yeah. And the, one of the things that I thought was a really big gift early on in my life was that I, I got the idea that it didn't take forever to fix things or to change them. Yeah. And, and so there right. was this transformation idea. happens at, at a decision, right? Right. <laughs> a lot of the brain is a yes or no <laughs> pathway. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's a do or don't do pathway. Mm -hmm. So it can be made that simple in a, in a lot of cases. Yeah, it's power and powerful to know that because I think people then go, well, I don't have any power or control over anything because all of this other stuff has hold of me. Mm -hmm. All this other stuff has hold of me and I've got no control or power here, which is self-defeating too, you know? So you might have some very real things going on in your brain uh, and you still have this ability to go, okay, what can I do about it? And yeah. Yeah. So with the DNA thing, because somebody was asking me more about the DNA testing um, okay. this past week, I just, can you talk a little bit more about that again, and then how people could um, find out more for the, for themselves or for somebody who is maybe struggling? Yeah. Buy a 10 pack for your, for your friends and family. <laughs> on my podcast, I interviewed the CEO for a DNA company and he went through what is his company's doing with uh, functional genomics. Mm -hmm. So they're taking the genomics and there's different kind of variations of a different gene. And that's going to change this process that, that comes out of basically what the blueprint of the human body tells the rest of the body to do and perform. And, uh, well, there's, uh, let's take dopamine since dopamine is such a, a big example is that yeah, there are genetic variants where dopamine is going to be very efficient or it's going to be very kind of almost deficient that it, it kind of just pumps out here and there. And then, of course, if that's the case, you're looking to find ways to pump out more dopamine because you don't have that steady state of it being produced. So then, of course, you're, you're searching and you're driving for that and craving it more. Mm -hmm. Well then there's different ways to support the dopamine system so that it's more efficient. And then hopefully it leads to less of that craving or desire to <laughs> continually pump out dopamine and find something that, that will, will stimulate it. Um, I also think that uh, the, and this goes into the exercise model too. Mm -hmm. So they give kind of these exercise diet and lifestyle things too, that will kind of, bring it up to a level where it's hopefully more sustainable and versus that world where you're constantly craving that next hit of dopamine and whatever will produce it. And uh, so it's looking at that blueprint and it's okay, well, it's deficient in this metabolic pathway and here's ways we can support it. And uh, that becomes very empowering. Mm -hmm. And uh, this also goes into then that huge, huge kind of debate of, well, how can we actually make inroads into the addiction world so there's less relapse and, and, and people can actually go on without <laughs> always constantly needing, needing something. Mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah, so this, this is a very exciting kind of area and, and field to, to be in and, and to explore. Um, and then, of course, there's serotonin. Um, so the, the serotonergic system, too, can obviously, uh, if it's not functioning properly, lead to feelings of more depression and, and that area and less body sensations. Well, there's ways to support serotonin. So people aren't always running to the fridge to find that sugar hit to help them out or, or all these other areas. Um, so 
it, it, it's fascinating and it's one of these kind of rabbit holes I'm starting to fall down myself and learn more and more about. And then two, meshing that up with a stimulation model where, okay, are there more precise exercises that we can do to kind of build these areas of, of the brain so that they are producing uh, more uh, stability in these different pathways and, and the, the results are are really really detailed and personalized when when you take that approach mm -hmm. and so how can people get their hands on that dna testing protocol or the kit or or the all that yeah, I'll send a link that you can put it, sure. put in the show notes there. And, okay, uh, great. So make sure you check that out, guys. If you're look, and it's like people who are interested in hacking through their own sort of self talk of you know I am this, I am that. And having a little bit of evidence on a piece of paper might help to dial in what's going on. And like when I'm joking, but not joking when I say buy a ten pack for your friends because of like all of all these healing modalities or assessments that can give you some sort of more insight about your behavior. Sometimes people who are homeless can't afford that kind of thing or who are teetering on the edge of homelessness, but it could be the thing that would help them to get the insight to be able to actually change that just enough that they could keep, you know, get steadied and righted again. And I mean, righted like a ship, you know, so you're not offside all the, but you're just kind of sailing calm the calm ocean and and so when for people who have this is kind of a have not way that you can help um people to get some tools that might might help them and i'm a fan of that so um and i think we're going to see more of that hopefully is that yeah either there's a big shift in the in the bureaucracy of healthcare and how it's implemented or we start to see more and more kind mm -hmm. of nonprofits start to fund things um, so that people can can get healthier, but unfortunately, yeah, right now it is you know, the people that need it the most are probably not getting it, and right. and that will require more time, more research, and more resources, and no one wants to hear that. That's so, right, exactly. That's well, and when you've been on benefits forever, <laughs> you don't really feel like you should have to pay out of pocket for any of this stuff. But and nor can you, because yeah, mm -hmm. it is new new field and uh, the biohacking world is for at this current state in time well-educated people that are looking mm -hmm. for performance to help them get better whether it's an athlete or entrepreneurs or ceos um these are the mm -hmm. kind of the echelon of society that's that's looking at these fields and and uh, and diving into it um but that's kind of the, the far end of the spectrum, the, mm -hmm. the peak performance. And it's the people struggling on the other side that, that would probably really benefit society a lot more if we were to mm -hmm. implement some of these new and innovative uh, strategies. So right. I was going to ask you what your favorite exercise is for people <clears throat> to just restore their balance, for example, in life. What's the most easy go-to thing that people it's all can do breathing exercises breathing. and there's so <laughs> many different breathing exercises out there mm -hmm. but breathing exercises have that calming effect on us and if you look at the breathing centers they're actually kind of in that middle of the brain stem which is very relaxing and and helps with body awareness and then you get all that free, delicious oxygen to fuel cells as well. Mm -hmm. So breathing exercises are, are just key. And there's, there's articles you can look up with uh, Navy SEALs doing a, a certain breathing exercise to calm them down when they're in these, these uh, horrible fighting situations. Right. And then with first responders as well. So they're in the, the thick of these, these really intense, intense situations. And this is one of the strategies they're using. Um, so in your day to day, you're, you're obviously stressed, but not to that level. So if it works for these high performers, then uh, it would be something for everyone to implement into their days. And uh, it's a matter of 
now just remembering to do them and setting those cues um, and developing those habits. But that would probably be the easiest one. And then find the music that also puts you into a different state that you want to be in. So yeah, there's the pump you up music. There's the relax you music mm -hmm. and don't go off what's cool. Go off of what actually changes your state and mood and instead and uh, find those different playlists and implement them at different parts of your day. And mm -hmm. that helps a lot of people out. There's, there's such a rich source of, of, uh, <laughs> of music out there too. And then the other is just movement. The, the biggest stimulation to the brain is movement and uh, doing it in ways that are uh, not going to tire you out, <laughs> um, but actually get the body moving. And uh, that's going to get the brain working and, and stimulate it. Uh, you might not, not notice this huge <laughs> spike in, in how you're feeling mm -hmm. right away, but we're meant to be moving several times, multiple times throughout our day. And if we don't, that's when we start to fall apart and deteriorate even quicker. Right. I'm a big, such a huge fan of Qigong and still people don't even know what yeah. I'm talking about. So right. you come to the Master Your Life website and check out Lee Holden Qigong. So that's Q-I-G-O-N-G. -G, and it's now uh, you can do a 30 day challenge there for nothing. So you can check that out. And 30 day challenges like it's uh, turn stress into vital energy, no pain, no pain. That's uh, not a 30 day challenge where you're kicking your own, but you're, just, <laughs> you're showing up and it's really beautiful. So, so I, yes, that's a free, a free thing. So again, come to the masteryourlife.ca website so that you can check that out and other healing technologies that help you to. Um, take back your health and well-being that are within your pocketbook, whatever that might be. Um, Dr. Dave, we're almost out of time for today. So what would be some final parting words you'd like to share with people who are either um, struggling themselves or have family members that are struggling with homelessness or um, be, just being on the verge of it? Because we're coming into winter in Canada. It is a serious thing. It's not like we're living on the sunny beach somewhere. People die here from not having a roof over their head. Absolutely. Uh, search out those resources. Um, and uh, the, the main thing is trying to, to do the stress management and stress mm -hmm. reduction. So um, not letting, as hard as it is, not letting your, your body deteriorate because of the stressful condition you're under. So look at those free techniques of just doing some deep breathing, relaxing music and movement, just going for a walk someplace that's going to clear your head and doing that as often as possible, as often as you need. And then find those, those connections in, in your life too, that, that help you mentally as well. Yeah. Beautifully put that help you mentally, physically, and emotionally. So everyone love yourselves, start there, love each other, Mind your minds, take care of your brains. Uh, for more, you can reach out to Dr. David Hardy at thehardybrain.ca or you can come to masteryourlife.ca. Uh, thanks again, everyone, for tuning in and sharing this episode far and wide um, to help people help themselves to be a better uh, human. All right, everyone, take care. That's all for us. Bye for now. Thank you for being a part of our program today. Master Your Life is a presentation of Leah Mattinson Enterprises, Inc. Join us next time on Master Your Life, helping you to discover the very best of you.